Beginning at about 4.30 p.m., over a period of about two hours, Confederate soldiers from two divisions of Longstreet's Corps and Union troops from the 3rd, 5th, and 2nd Corps had fiercely fought for control of the wheat field. Hood's and McLaws' rebel brigades succeeded in pushing out two of Sickles in one of Barnes's Union brigades, only to be themselves subsequently chased out of the wheat field by Caldwell's division of the Second Corps. Control of the now trampled field of grain had already changed hands twice, and the fighting was far from over. This installment of the wheat field fighting begins where Part Two left off. Caldwell has retaken the field, but is about to be surprised from the west by yet another Confederate brigade, led by General Wolford. His fresh units undertake an aggressive assault, reinvigorating the energies of the earlier victorious rebel brigades pushed out by Caldwell, and now the tables are about to turn yet again. This video has been extracted from a comprehensive work that encompasses every inch of the Gettysburg battlefield, a highly detailed animation covering over 60 hours of conflict that took place on July 1st through 3rd, 1863. For more information about this acclaimed work, visit our website, gettysburganimated.com. The Stony Hill had been cleared of Confederate soldiers by Zook and Kelly. Brooks' sweeping charge through the wheat field, along with Cross's stubborn determination to keep the rebels at bay on the eastern side, resulted in Caldwell's division accomplishing much of the task of rescuing the crumbling Union left. Henry Fonts, in his book Gettysburg the Second Day, writes, quote, at this time, the colors of the Union regiments waved over a north-south line from Trossel Woods, across the Stony Hill, to near the west front of Rose's Woods. The wheat field was again in Federal hands, and except for the Confederate presence at Devil's Den, Sickles' position had been recovered. But Wolford's fresh brigade was clearly seen approaching by all of the Union general officers on the western side of the Stony Hill. Shortly after Caldwell had dispatched Brooke into the fray, his reserve brigade, he sought help for his overextended division, and the timing was critical. Riding along the Wheatfield Road, he met up with General Schweitzer, whose regiments were positioned along the south edge of Trozel Woods. Schweitzer remarked that he would comply with the support request with pleasure, if so ordered by Barnes, in command of his brigade. The clock continued to tick as Caldwell headed off to find Barnes, who was not too far away. When the two met up, they discussed the situation, after which Barnes and Caldwell rode back to discuss things with Schweitzer. Barnes asked Schweitzer if he would lead his brigade forward. Schweitzer said he would, if Barnes wished it, and Barnes said that he did. More minutes had passed. After Schweitzer finally ordered his brigade to attention, Barnes took a position in front of the brigade and made a few patriotic remarks. Only then did Schweitzer finally lead his 1,000 men into the Wheatfield pandemonium, headed for the wall at the south side of the field. But in the minutes that had passed, with the battlefield amenities concluded, the Federal situation was already starting to deteriorate. While Caldwell was lobbying Barnes for support, his third brigade, Zooks, who had just been mortally wounded, was in the process of pushing Kershaw's brigade completely off of the Stony Hill. But the subsequent ad hoc commanders of Zooks' brigade immediately discovered they had a problem on their right rear, off to their west. Initially, Colonel Kelly, in command of Caldwell's 2nd Brigade, thought they must be Federal troops, but after dispatching an investigative party, all soon learned that the advancing line was not friendly. It was Wolford's 1,600-man brigade of Georgians rapidly closing on the Stony Hill.
There was much confusion in Zook's brigade as its regiments immediately began adjusting their positions to avoid being flanked. Kelly's brigade had a slightly better orientation with respect to receiving Wolford's attack, more westerly and slightly advanced. But Kelly soon had a renewed threat on his left, as Kershaw's reformed left-wing regiments, the ones heavily mauled earlier by Union artillery, joined the Confederate rebound on Wolford's right. Further to the south, at the western edge of Rose's Woods, Brooks' sweeping advance across the wheat field was running out of steam. Brooke had pushed three of Semmes' regiments to the Rose farm fields, where they initially took refuge behind a stone wall. The two opposing forces were heavily engaged across the fence line field between the wall and the woods, but reforming regiments from Anderson's brigade, now commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Luffman, fired into Brooks's flank, while soldiers from Semmes's 10th Georgia, carrying their unit's flag, attempted to skirt around his left. The second Delaware refused its line to thwart the attempts, but without support, Brooks's brigade's forward position was becoming untenable. Wolford's brigade first assailed Kelly's right and then encountered Zook head-on. Joined on the right by the 2nd, 8th, and 3rd South Carolina Battalion from Kershaw's brigade, the Confederates methodically pushed Zook and Kelly back across the crest of the Stony Hill and into the wheat field. This Union withdrawal from the west was taking place just as Schweitzer's regiments were moving across the field in grand style to the south. Harry Fonts described the scene, writing, quote, As the right of the brigade approached the south end of the field and the stone wall there, Schweitzer saw a bad omen that he did not understand and appreciate at the time. Two or three regiments were leaving the Stony Hill, unquote. Considering the units to be regiments falling back after having been relieved, Schweitzer continued an unobstructed trek to the wall and took up position where the 17th Maine fought an hour or so earlier. While the prior formalities had delayed Schweitzer's arrival at the position, it was of no consequence. An earlier arrival would not have had any impact on the events that were about to unfold. Soon, Schweitzer was taking fire from the direction of the Stony Hill. Initially, he thought it was friendly fire from the units on that hill, shooting over the heads of his men, toward the rebels in the woods, with offending rounds falling short of their mark. Trouble was, there was not a strong force in his front to be targeted, at least not yet. An aide to Schweitzer, on horseback, and high enough to get a good look, remarked, quote, Colonel, I'll be damned if I don't think we're faced the wrong way. The Rebs are up there in the woods behind us on the right, unquote. Reality hit home for Schweitzer when the 4th Michigan was suddenly assailed at close range on their right flank and right rear. Kershaw's South Carolina regiments came charging over the southern lip of the hill and through the marshy flatland at its base. They initially chased the rapidly withdrawing regiments of 1st Kelly and then Brooke, and then poured devastating, infilating fire into the flank of the 4th Michigan and 62nd Pennsylvania, manning the wall and facing south. Colonel Jeffords of the 4th Michigan somehow managed to change front to face the onslaught. The 62nd Pennsylvania quickly followed suit, but Schweitzer's brigade, deemed the reinforcements for Caldwell's division, were vastly outnumbered and being pummeled on three sides. One of Gettysburg's most heroic moments ensued when the national flag of the 4th Michigan, new and ceremoniously issued, was abandoned at a forward position. Jeffords, who had days before pledged to protect it, rushed back into the fray with a brother and a friend to recover it. The flag was recovered, but all three men were severely wounded, Jeffords mortally. Schweitzer's brigade suffered over 45% casualties, and withdrew. Ayres' division of Sykes' 5th Corps began arriving on the north slopes of Little Round Top 
at about the same time that Caldwell's division was arriving from the north and beginning its initial deployment into the wheat field. Weed's brigade arrived first and was initially headed west like so many other units this day in support of Sickles' overextended 3rd Corps line. But after meeting up with Caldwell's brigades, Weed was immediately ordered back to the other hot spot of the hour and rushed to the crest of Little Round Top. Next to arrive was Burbank's brigade of nearly 1,000 troops, followed by Day's brigade of nearly 1,600. Both brigades were made up of regiments of U.S. regulars. The two brigades took up staging positions on the forward slopes of Munchhauer Hill, or what others have referred to as the north slope of Little Round Top. Burbank formed a line of regiments in front. Day's regiments were stacked behind. Both brigades had ringside seats to Caldwell's initial assault and clearing of the wheat field. As Caldwell began pushing the rebels out of the wheat field, Sykes ordered Ayres' two waiting brigades down the slopes to its eastern edge and in support of Caldwell's left. Burbank's regiments slogged through the mucky valley through which the plum run ran, and climbed the eastern slope of Hauk's Ridge to a wall that ran northeast to southwest at its crest. The brigade deployed behind that wall, with the field in their front. About ten minutes later, Day's brigade deployed in three lines behind Burbank, on the eastern-facing side of the slope. Minutes earlier, Caldwell had ordered his reserve brigade into the wheat field. While his men were initially having great success, Caldwell's afternoon already had a fair dose of frustration due to his earlier negotiations with Barnes for Schweitzer's support, and it was about to get worse. After he left Barnes, he headed next to find Ayers. The two met up in front of the wall at the field's eastern edge right about the same time that the tide was turning against the 1st Division of the 2nd Corps. Advised and surprised by the notification that his troops were giving way, and running for the rear, Caldwell spurred his horse and rode toward the chaos. When Cross's brigade originally charged the rebels in the wheat field, the right regiments of his brigade, the 61st New York and the 81st Pennsylvania, fiercely battled Anderson's Confederates from a slight ridge in the southeast quadrant of the field. They remained on that high ground as first Kelly, and later Brooke advanced beyond them. Meanwhile, Caldwell's left regiments, the 148th New York and the 5th New Hampshire, continued to press the right wing of the enemy deep into Rose's woods. They remained heavily engaged with the 1st Texas and 3rd Arkansas from Robertson's brigade and the 15th Georgia from Benning's brigade, who were grudgingly giving up the ground they had taken in Rose's woods during the first wave of rebel assaults on the wheat field over an hour earlier. The fight had evolved into a standoff when rear guard elements of the 1st Texas refused to be pushed back any further by the 5th New Hampshire. By the time Burbank's brigade had taken up a position on the eastern edge of the wheat field, Cross had been mortally wounded and McKean had assumed command of the brigade. Burbank's position on the ridge made his left regiment's targets not necessarily for the rebels in the woods, but rather for Benning's sharpshooters holed up in Devil's Den. In response, Burbank reported, quote, The left company of the 17th was thrown back to confront this fire and to a more secure position under a slight rise of ground, unquote. The 5th New Hampshire and the 148th New York fighting on Burbank's left remained positioned until the returning rebel tide would force them back. They would be the last of Caldwell's units to leave the wheat field. With respect to the minutes immediately after the Caldwell Ayers meeting, Harry Fonts comments, quote, After Caldwell's abrupt departure, Ayers decided that his brigades should sweep the woods in their front and gave orders for it to be done, unquote. The subject woods were actually to the front left, 
and the order specifics were for Burbank's brigade to wheel left from the wall, with his right arcing into the wheat field. Factoring in the conversation with Caldwell, one could easily suggest that Ayers had decided his pending action before witnessing the start of the 1st Division's collapse, and that said collapse had not yet progressed far enough to warrant a change of orders by Ayers. Burbank's eventual position would have been a bad one, a line oriented east to west, facing the woods to the south, with the right flank poised to be infiladed by Kershaw and Wolford. As executed, Burbank's line advanced as planned, but got only about one-half the way through the 90-degree arcing maneuver. At this juncture, the men of the 2nd U.S., on Burbank's right, saw Wolford bearing down on their right flank and threatening their rear, and they attempted to adjust their position accordingly. The center of Burbank's line became immersed in the chaos of Schweitzer's retreating regiments. The left regiments, the 11th and 17th U.S. regulars, were assailed by the advancing regiments of Anderson, Robertson, and Benning. It was now Burbank's brigade that was receiving fire from three sides, and they too were forced back toward the cover of the stone wall from which they came. As Burbank moved into the wheat field, Day's brigade waited in reserve on the backside slope of Houck's Ridge. Their front line of regiments moved up slightly, taking positions behind the wall just vacated by Burbank. Captain Dunn, of the 12th U.S. Regulars, reported that his regiment remained stationary, writing, quote, Until I received an order to move by the right flank a distance equal to my front, unquote. Author James Woods, in his book, Gettysburg, July 2nd, The Ebb and Flow of Battle, expounds on the subject, writing, quote, Though unknown to Captain Dunn at the time, this movement was a vain attempt to extend the regular's line to prevent it from being flanked, unquote. As Day's brigade waited, Wolford's line continued to move closer, now straddling the Wheatfield Road. Wolford's left regiments, Phillips Legion, Cobbs's Legion and the 24th Georgia had virtually no federal infantry to their front, but were being slowed by the artillery fire of Walcott's battery. Walcott had returned minutes earlier to the 5th Corps' front after a brief stint on the McGilvery line. The guns immediately found themselves in a position to do some damage to Wolford, but at the same time were extremely vulnerable due to the absence of any infantry support. As Burbank's men came back to the wall, Days were able to start for the rear. Both brigades fell back in good order, pressured by over half of Longstreet's coalescing corps. The regulars had spent about an hour in the wheat field area, but incurred a horrific number of casualties. Burbank's brigade lost nearly 50%, while Days' brigade, which spent its time primarily in reserve and in retreat, lost 25% of its strength. About the same time that Day was moving to a support position behind Burbank, the brigades of Sykes's 3rd Division, led by General Crawford, were arriving on the north slope of Little Round Top. Fisher's brigade of 1,600 men arrived first, followed by McCandless's brigade of a little more than 1,200 men. Fisher subsequently moved to a supporting position on the crest of Little Round Top. McCandless moved into battle formation on the western slope of the hill, facing the wheat field, at about the same time that Burbank was beginning his ill-fated charge. It is important to note here that Longstreet's attacking force in the wheat field theater, at this point, was all in. The Confederate units, Wolford's brigade, most of Kershaw's, most of Semmes's, all of Anderson's, in parts of Robertson's and Benning's brigade, formed a contiguous north-south front over 600 yards across. They had defeated a parade of Union brigades that had been thrown into the fray, but what the rebels had on the front at this point was all they had. But the Federals, on the other hand, kept coming. Following Crawford's 5th Corps Division, 
came Sedgwick's entire 14,000-man 6th Corps, led by Wheaton's brigade, commanded by Colonel Nevin. While the entire 6th Corps wouldn't fully arrive in this sector for over an hour, with each passing minute, the Federal forces on Little Round Top slopes, facing the Plum Run Valley and Longstreet's weary units, was getting stronger and stronger. As Burbank Day and Schweitzer were all retreating up the western slopes of Little Round Top to the safety of the fresh Union lines, Longstreet's forces advanced on their heels. His right-wing units slowly came to a halt along the crest of Hawks Ridge at the eastern edge of Rose's Woods. The left wing continued to press forward. Wolford on the far left overran Walcott's battery. Kershaw's regiments moved further down the slope to the western banks of Plum Run, while Semmes's brigade took up a position on the downslope in Kershaw's rear. The Confederate forces had totally cleared the wheat field. It had now changed hands for a third time. It's hard to imagine the chaos on the opposite slopes of the Plum Run Valley. The ebb and flow of this theater of the battle had been going on now for nearly three hours. Wolford's brigade had driven all before it, and it was briefly paused behind a stone wall near Walcott's captured guns when Longstreet issued orders for Wolford to pull back. Nevin's brigade had arrived and taken up a position opposite Wolford and was joined minutes later by Bartlett's brigade. Longstreet realized then, and McLaws and Wolford acknowledged later, that there was nothing to be gained by staying. To the south, Crawford and McCandless were anxiously waiting for the retreating Union soldiers to clear their front guns. Harry Fonts writes, quote, They could see the rebels approaching through the fringe of trees east of the wheat field and down the slope into Plum Run's Valley. The smoke so obscured the attackers that from their vantage point the reserves could not distinguish the Confederates from the Federals who were falling back before them, unquote. Earlier, as Nevin's brigade moved toward the front, the 98th Pennsylvania distanced itself from the rest of the brigade when they followed a staff officer, frequently moving at the double quick. As such, they arrived a good ten minutes before the rest of the brigade and immediately formed on the left rear of McCandless's reserves. With his regiment separated from the rest of the brigade, Major Kohler, in command of the 98th, saw the Confederates approaching the hill and Gibbs's guns. Acting on his own, he ordered the regiment to fix bayonets and charge down the slope. Both the tentatively advancing Confederates, as well as the patiently waiting Federals, were surprised by the bold advance. Kohler's men quickly made it to the marshy ground along the Plum Run, without too much resistance, but got bogged down by the, quote, feet-sucking muck, unquote. As the forward elements of the regiment made it across the bog, they paused at the foot of Hawks Ridge Slope while the regimental stragglers caught up, followed quickly by McCandless's regiments, who had by now joined the charge. History depicts General Crawford, the division commander, grandly leading the charge down the slope and across the valley he would later come to own in post-war times, not to mention the present-day park road that bears his name, Crawford Avenue. At the north end of the Union front, three regiments of Nevin's brigade initially covered the right flank of the charging Pennsylvania reserves. They fired a few volleys before launching their own counterattack down the slope. Just like their 98th Pennsylvania comrades to the south, they encountered little resistance since Wolford's brigade had minutes before begun their withdrawal. The Union counterattack was picking up steam as Nevin recovered Walcott's guns. In the center, McCandless's right regiments, along with the 11th Pennsylvania, detached earlier from Fisher's brigade to strengthen the defensive line, pushed back Kershaw's 
and Semmes's massive rebels. To the south, McCandless's left regiments in the 98th Pennsylvania pressured the Anderson-Robertson-Benning cluster. The fresh federal forces pushed west. The exhausted Confederates withdrew before them. Within minutes, the Union infantry had established a line along the eastern boundary of the wheat field, along the present-day Ayers Avenue. The official reports in post-war recollections from senior officers of both armies differ as to exactly how long the Confederates spent at the wall on the crest of Hawks Ridge, specifically Semmes's regiments, before being forced to withdraw by the Pennsylvania Reserves. In post-war articles by McClaws, he wrote, quote, Semmes's brigade occupied the crest on one side of the ravine beneath Little Round Top on the second, and stayed there until about 11 that night, unquote. On this subject, author James Woods writes, quote, McLaws's articles were meant to refute what he considered to be Union General Crawford's spurious claim of having forced McLaws's troops to withdraw. Unquote. One thing is certain, however, Semmes's and all of McLaws's units did give back the ground they had gained in the wheat field, and they bivouacked that night in the Rose farm fields and near the Emmitsburg Road. The Federals had retaken the field by dark marking the fourth time control of the entire field had changed hands this day. The fighting in the wheat field began about 4.45 on the afternoon of July 2nd and ended when it was too dark for the opposing forces to see and kill each other. With local sunset being 7.41 on this calendar date, there was no daylight savings time in 1863, most historians cite three and a half hours of horrific fighting. The attacking Confederate force eventually contained about 8,000 men. The Union defenders, actually engaged, eventually totaled nearly 12,000 men. But unlike the rebels, the Federals had over 10,000 as yet unengaged troops waiting nearby as the sun set. In all, about 20,000 men fought here, and there were over 6,000 casualties. Nearly one of every three soldiers was either killed, wounded, or captured. There is some ambiguity regarding how many times the wheat field changed hands. Authors frequently cite six, seven, eight times or more. It has been shown here that it did in fact completely change hands four times, the opposing armies each time clearing the field. However, it's not that cut and dry, and from the perspective of individual units, the control of specific areas of the field swung back and forth numerous other times during the afternoon's fierce fighting. And from that perspective, it's safe to say the wheat field changed hands over a half a dozen times. <laughs> 